just about every day. Yeah. Okay, I think we're ready to get started. Uh, good afternoon and welcome to the Cato Institute. My name is Tim Lynch and I'm the director of Cato's project on criminal justice. The title of our forum today is Should Citizen Journalism Be Against the Law? And what we want to do is examine the opportunities and challenges that are presented to us by the advances in video technology that we've seen over the past 15 to 20 years. Everyone here knows that the police have been using video technology for many years. We've seen the video uh, clips from the dashboards of uh, police cruisers. That is used as evidence in court. Uh, we've seen uh, cameras installed uh, at uh, traffic intersections above uh, uh, the traffic lights to catch people who are running uh, red lights. Um, and some cities, some cities like Baltimore um, have installed uh, cameras uh, in public spaces over, over public sidewalks. But we also know that the police are sometimes very hostile to the idea of citizens using cell phones to film the police officers at work. Um, more and more ordinary citizens are taking out their cell phones when things are happening, whether it's a car accident or police confronting people uh, in, in public spaces. Um, and the police are sometimes very hostile to uh, when they see that going on. Now, sometimes it manifests itself when a police officer simply orders a citizen to turn that off or put it away. Now, it's hard for us to gauge how many times that happens because 99 times out of 100, when a police officer orders somebody to put it away, the camera is put away immediately, so we don't have that film footage. What we do see is sometimes the footage where uh, either the police are not aware of a person doing the filming or, um, or uh, uh, the person says he's turning off the camera, but then he uh, actually continues uh, running the film. So sometimes it's a police officer right there on the scene ordering that the filming be stopped. Other times uh, the police and prosecutors move against somebody days or weeks after when they discover uh, they didn't not, were not aware of it at the time, but the filming is then loaded up onto the internet like YouTube days or weeks later and then it comes to the attention of the authorities and then they move against the person who was doing the filming as a violation uh, of local law. So the central question that we want to explore today is whether it should be illegal uh, for someone to record the actions of an on-duty police officer when he's in public space, when he's not interfering with the physical, physically with the actions of the police officer. You know, in the old days, if you, had a, if you had a video camera or these big cameras that they use on TV, that could interfere with the police doing their job. But if they're standing back and not interfering, letting the police do their work, can that ever be uh, illegal? There is some disputes under current law as to whether or not it violates a statute here or there, but the main question we want to explore is whether it should be illegal. Should those laws be changed so that this type of filming uh, can take place? Okay, before we hear from our panel of experts, I do want to take a moment now to ask those of you who did come with cell phones, would you please as a courtesy to our speakers, would you just make sure that they are silenced uh, so it will not interrupt uh, our speakers as, as they are giving their talks. Thank you. Uh, we do have three speakers today and our format is straightforward. Each speaker is going to give a 15 minute presentation uh, and then we're going to uh, take your questions after they're done with their uh, initial presentations. And I'm going to introduce each speaker in turn. Our first speaker today is my colleague, David Ritkers. Uh, Dave is a legal policy analyst here at Cato, and his specialty is counterterrorism and criminal justice issues. Before joining the Cato staff, he served as an officer in the U.S. Special Forces. Uh, he served three tours in Afghanistan, and he earned uh, several commendations for his service, including two bronze stars. After the service, he went to law school at the University of North Carolina, where he earned his JD degree. Since he joined Cato, he's published many articles in various publications such as National Review, the Christian Science Monitor, and the Wall Street Journal, and he's been writing on this issue of citizen journalism and appearing on radio and TV on a lot of the recent incidents uh, that have taken place. Uh, so would you please welcome David Rinkers. Thanks for coming. Uh, the last six months have uh, given us multiple cases where a law enforcement officer has stepped beyond the bounds of their authority uh, and 
that encounter has then been captured, as Tim noted, on video and audio uh, by cell phones and posted on YouTube. Uh, and the frequency of these web postings has increased with the ubiquitous nature of recording capability now in everyone's pocket in the room. Uh, and law enforcement agencies have responded to this, uh, some, I would say, better than others. Uh, the, uh, some are actually equipping some or all of their officers with recording capability of their own, but some, as Tim noted, are working to actively deter people from recording uh, the actions of a public official in a public place. Uh, so one of the means of deterrence has been the use of state wiretapping laws to prosecute those who have recorded uh, the actions of police officers, and I hope to lay a foundation on this issue uh, of the state wiretapping laws uh, in contrast and, and, and conflict with citizen journalism and foster a productive discussion. Uh, I'll talk first about the legal framework um, and discuss where some of these cases, these instances, uh, have uh, deterred citizen journalism and, and close with a discussion of some of the constitutional issues you touch on and, uh, and talk about in a few years where the issue may be. Uh, first, some background on, on wiretap laws. You may ask, you know, how does a wiretapping law uh, prevent me from recording something that's happening in public with a cell phone? Uh, well, in fact, wiretapping laws were originally passed in order to protect the privacy and liberties of uh, citizens from uh, warrantless wiretapping by the government or the, uh, the uh, unconsented and, and unknowing interception of their communications. Uh, but there's two provisions in, in any wiretapping law, state or federal, uh, that, uh, that pertain either to wire communications or to oral communications. Now, when we say wire communications, this is the stereotypical thing we think of with wiretapping. If you're hooking a tape recorder to someone's phone and they don't know about it and don't consent to it, that's wiretapping, plain and simple. But they will also have an oral communication provision where the interception of uh, a conversation between two people sitting on a park bench or in a restaurant, uh, if they're not consenting to that, depending on the way the law is structured, that could be uh, wiretapping as well and fall within uh, the scope of a wiretapping law. Now, I should also note that this only addresses the audio portion of any of the recordings, that, uh, that there's no law that, that's going to prevent uh, still photography or the video without the audio. And we can talk about that uh, in the question and answer period if you want. Um, so with wiretap statutes, the federal and the vast majority of the states are one-party consent law. Basically, if you're a party to the conversation, you can record it. Uh, however, a minority of states, 12, uh, are two-party or unanimous consent laws where uh, both parties to a conversation would have to consent uh, for the recording to take place. And with a minority of these states, actually only a few of them really make it illegal to record other people's uh, voices out in public. Uh, this is true because most of them uh, will say that their wiretapping for purposes of oral communications only pertain to private conversations. Uh, and they take this generally to mean that where there is no uh, reasonable expectation of privacy, there's no violation of the state wiretapping law. Uh, so if it's happening in a public street in front of a crowd, you really can't claim that someone was wiretapping when they recorded what you said in front of the public. Uh, but there are a couple of states that are standouts in this arena. Um, the Massachusetts state wiretapping statute has always been understood to prohibit uh, the recording of someone's voices, uh, voice or conversation without their consent. And this has actually been upheld by their state Supreme Court. And the Illinois statute has actually gotten worse over time. In the early 90s, there was a case where uh, a motorist was pulled over and he had a tape recorder on his person. Uh, and he was put in the back of a police cruiser and two officers had a conversation in the front of the police car. He recorded it and the state Supreme Court said, you knew he had the recorder, you knew it was with him in the back of the car, you had the conversation in front of him, there's no violation of an expectation of privacy. So the state legislature went in and changed the law to make what this person had done explicitly illegal. Uh, so the law has gotten worse. Um, I'm going to talk about Maryland next, but I, I want to just stress that we're not talking just about the Maryland wiretapping law. We're talking about uh, the, the broader policy issues, should these recordings be illegal. Uh, Having said that, I think that the recent events within the state of Maryland make clear uh, the case uh, for citizen journalism uh, and, and that the average citizen should be doing nothing perceived wrong by the law uh, when they're recording police officers who are on duty. Uh, Maryland is a, a state with a two-party consent rule, uh, but Maryland courts have held uh, that the recording of an oral communication uh, only runs afoul of the state wiretapping law if we're talking about a private conversation. And the Attorney General of Maryland uh, weighed in in July, bolstering this view with a survey of parallel state wiretapping laws. Uh, 
but we have several cases that, uh, that show an active deterrence of recording by law enforcement. The most famous, of course, is Anthony Graber. And this is uh, probably the video that you've all seen on YouTube. Uh, Graber is a 25-year-old staff sergeant in the Maryland Air National Guard. He was riding his motorcycle on I-95 uh, and recording the experience uh, on a helmet-mounted camera. Now, he's riding fast. He's riding arguably unsafe. He's popping wheelies and weaving in and out of traffic. Uh, but he gets pulled over by a Maryland state trooper in an unmarked gray sedan. The state trooper cuts Graber off and emerges from the driver's side door while drawing his gun, dressed in a gray pullover and blue jeans, and his badge is not visible. So for the first four or five seconds of this encounter, it looks like a carjacking. Well, Graber uh, received a traffic citation and went on his way, but then when he got home, he posted the encounter, uh, uh, and including the audio portion of, of what the police officer said to him on YouTube. And then a week later, six state troopers showed up at his house and served felony arrest and search warrants uh, on him for felony violations of the state wiretap statute and seized electronics from his home. And if convicted on all charges, he faces up to 16 years in prison. Uh, now, I would note that it does appear that the charges against Graber may be dismissed. Uh, a preliminary hearing on the matter uh, showed the judge openly skeptical that the trooper uh, stopped Graber. Th th he probably didn't have a reasonable expectation of privacy. It's on an on-ramp, I'm sorry, off-ramp on I-95, and anyone passing by with their window open would be able to hear the conversation. Uh, and the judge also indicated a willingness to analyze the issue, as uh, Pennsylvania has, uh, noting that uh, that because police officers are public officials and the public expects to be recorded in many of their interactions with the police, then the police can't bar them from recording it as well. So what's good for the goose is good for the gander. Um, but uh, I would note that uh, the prosecution continues, and Mr. Cassidy's office uh, continues the prosecution, even though jurisdictions, other jurisdictions within Maryland have, view the state wiretapping provision differently. Uh, another recent case, a police officer in St. Mary's County, Maryland, uh, arrested a woman named Yvonne Shaw for uh, videotaping him while he was uh, responding to a disturbance call in her neighborhood. Um, now, we haven't seen the video from that encounter because uh, the, the state's attorney in that jurisdiction dropped the charges against Ms. Shaw for recording uh, the encounter with the police officer, and he's now being investigated as a result of this incident. So that's evidence, and we just haven't seen that video yet. Uh, but it would, in a sense, be a bad outcome for the development of the law and the challenge to uh, what I see as, as a, just a bad policy flowing from the wiretapping law in Maryland if the charges were just to go away. It's good for Mr. Graber for this case to go away, certainly. Uh, but uh, police elsewhere in the state are using the, the wiretapping provision as a deterrence uh, against recording them. Uh, we have another video that's posted on YouTube of an arrest at the Preakness. Uh, and uh, there's a woman lying on the floor, bleeding from the face, uh, and several officers are trying to, uh, to put her in custody. Uh, and in this instance, this is a gotcha moment. Uh, it's, it's actually a justified arrest. The woman had assaulted other people at the Preakness, and then when police officers responded to the fight, uh, she assaulted them. Uh, so it's a good arrest, uh, but it's a gotcha moment, which is you know where we're seeing just the use of force at the end of an encounter, but none of the context that came before it. So the police officers on the scene wanted to deter uh, the person filming it uh, uh, to take, make them turn off the camera. And so one of the officers does so. He comes over and says, says, hey, do me a favor and turn it off. It's illegal to videotape anybody's voice or anything else against the law in the state of Maryland. Uh, so that's the takeaway, is the deterrent effect. Uh, but the case for citizen journalism and, and, and uh, providing transparency and accountability through this route uh, for police actions was most clearly made in the beating of University of Maryland student Jack uh, John McKenna uh, earlier this year. McKenna was one of hundreds of students celebrating the home basketball victory against Duke. Uh, and as he approached a, a line of police officers, uh, mounted police officers, uh, he stopped. And then three Prince George's uh, uh, officers in riot gear uh, came over and, and beat him savagely. Uh, they then filed false felony assault charges against him, claiming that he had assaulted the mounted officers. Well, then video came to light uh, showing that uh, that is not what happened, that he did not start the fight, he did not assault the officers, and, and he was beaten without provocation. Uh, and four officers uh, associated with the event have been suspended, and they face uh, federal and state investigations. And in this case, the video made all of the difference. If we hadn't seen the video, those false charges would stand. Those officers would still be on the job. Uh, justice uh, would not have been done uh, in that case. 
And uh, it's also interesting to note that when officials went uh, to look at the relevant security cameras that the police have access to in this case, the relevant 90 seconds where McKenna was beaten were missing. It's pretty convenient. Um, the McKenna case, I think, epitomizes the public benefit of citizen journalism. Uh, but once again, citizens who, who engage in recording the police do so under the threat of being arrested. And this remains true both in states where there is a two-party consent rule in a wiretapping statute and those without. Uh, there's a woman currently suing in Florida. Uh, she was recording her interaction with police officers when she was asking why they were arresting her son. Uh, so she is suing with the support of the ACLU. We've seen cases in New Hampshire and Oregon along similar lines. The police chief in Beaverton, Oregon says, I know it's a violation of the law. I don't care. I'm going to continue to arrest people who tape my police officers. Um, so in those states, uh, the charges fall apart as soon as a judge touches them, but police officers continue to arrest people who uh, record their activities. <clears throat> and the effect is contempt of cop, not contempt of court. That's valid, but, uh, but contempt of cop, when police officers arrest those doing things that they disapprove of, illegal or not. Uh, so uh, the lesson is that you'll beat the rap, but not the ride. Uh, on the other side of the equation, a North Carolina woman uh, was recently arrested while filming police activity from her front porch. Uh, and uh, she was charged with resisting, obstructing, or delaying a police officer. And she was actually convicted of this. Uh, the judge agreed with the police officer that, he, that she was obstructing the police by recording uh, the activity, once again, of a public official in a public place. Uh, and uh, we should note that uh, she wasn't the only person watching. She was just the only person recording. So the wiretapping law really is just a vehicle for police to deter transparency uh, and accountability by the public. And the laws that uh, facilitate this, I think, certainly should change. Uh, if the police are acting properly within the scope of their powers, uh, they have nothing to fear from being recorded. Uh, but the laws that are in place have not certainly kept pace with technology. Uh, cell phones with uh, video recording capability, audio recording capability are, once again, ubiquitous everywhere within society. Uh, and now I think the calculus has changed such that it's far more likely that the average citizen is going to face uh, prosecution by the police for recording them than actually have their liberties protected by these laws. Uh, and this is true in other applications of the two-party consent laws. If someone calls you and on the telephone and you happen to record it without their consent and they're threatening you or extorting, uh, embezzling, or I'm sorry, extorting something from you, uh, uh, blackmailing, then that recording is barred because you didn't have their consent when they broke the law. Uh, and you've committed a felony in recording it. Uh, and I know that Mr. Castle actually has some experience with these kinds of events, and I, I'd like to hear more about uh, some of those events today if we could. Um, we also have to note there's a, this touches on some constitutional uh, controversies here. While there's no legal consensus supporting a, a pure First Amendment right to record police activity, courts have been nipping at the edges of this issue, both from the angle of the right to record police and the right to publish those uh, recordings. On the recording side, we have, uh, we have uh, several decisions recognizing uh, citizens' right to record public meetings uh, or matters of public interest. Uh, and I think there's a convergence of the free speech and the press clause of the First Amendment here. It's increasingly difficult to separate the paid press uh, from citizens who may reach a comparable audience via their blog, their Facebook page, and, and a YouTube channel. Uh, and on the publication side, even the Massachusetts wiretapping statute did not trump the First Amendment right of, uh, uh, of someone to publish prescribed audio in, in some circumstances. Um, I want to close by noting that, the, uh, handful of that a handful of police departments have embraced video and audio recording technology, and they're now outfitting their officers uh, with recording devices that uh, either look like an overgrown Bluetooth uh, headset um, or uh, it looks like a pager and it clips to the front of their shirt. Uh, and I think this is a positive development. I think it, it's one that especially has application in the most uh, intense interactions between the police and, and the citizenry. Uh, SWAT raids, if an officer is willing to put on 45 pounds of, of arms and armament, uh, then I think putting on five pounds worth of camera is not a significant additional burden. Uh, so in short, I look forward to that day when I think more police officers will accept uh, the legitimate role of cameras as an honest witness uh, in their interactions be, uh, with the public. Uh, many jurisdictions already require the taping of uh, interrogations uh, that shows that confessions were not coerced. And, and you know, the bottom line is, is it makes great evidence. It helps investigations. Uh, so I think that, uh, um, think that eventually we'll move towards a point where citizen journalism is not seen as a crime, but, uh, but seen as a First Amendment right.
Thanks. Thanks, Dave. Uh, our next speaker serves as the state's attorney for Harford County, Maryland. Uh, he's had that post for many years, having been reelected uh, to the post uh, for six times. Uh, before that, he had been serving as the assistant state's attorney since 1977, so he has decades of experience uh, as a prosecutor. And as a career prosecutor, he's been involved in various professional organizations, such as the Maryland State's Attorney Association. He's also the past president of the National District Attorneys Association and continues to serve on its board. He joined the Army in 1968 and was awarded a Combat Infantry Badge, the Purple Heart, and the Army Commendation Medal. Although he was severely injured uh, when he returned home from uh, Vietnam, he went on to college and earned a degree in psychology from the University of Arizona and then his law degree from the University of Baltimore. He's been in the news recently because he is the chief prosecutor in the Anthony Graber case that David Ritgers uh, was speaking about. So would you please welcome Joe Cassily. Thank you. Let me begin by stating my, my feeling about this, and that is that I am in favor of more uh, the ability to use cameras and to do audio taping um, in more situations uh, than we currently allow. One of the things I think that's, that's important to look at is that uh, I believe that two-party consent laws are unduly intrusive into civil liberties. And that when we talk about the ability, the, these issues with filming police officers, we're pretty much always talking about them in states with two-party consent. We don't have this problem in states with one-party consent where the individual uh, is a party to a conversation with, with anyone, law enforcement or anyone else, and he wants to, to record that conversation. We only run into these issues in two-party consent states where, um, for some unknown reason that I, that I am unable to perceive, you have to, if you are the intended audience of remarks made by someone else, whether they're threatening you, whether they're trying to bribe you, uh, you have to get their permission to record th that conversation. And I think this is really what we need to focus on is why are we making criminals of a huge number of people um, because they want to record a conversation that they are the intended audience of, okay? So this is what a two-party consent law accomplishes. And I'm against making criminals of people for no apparent reason or purpose uh, that's out there. So I, I really hope that um, in pursuing the Anthony Graber case that I am focusing a spotlight on the state law of Maryland and calling for delegates and senators and those people that have been critical of what I have done here uh, to really examine the a state law which goes back to 1978 and predates things like miniature tape recorders, uh, miniature cameras, cell phones and all of the other things that we've developed in the meantime that allow us to do this this recording. The other thing I want to make clear is that n none of this impacts video recording. So that what Graber did with respect to the video recording portion of uh, his helmet cam, and I, and I think really um, I understand Mr. Graber may have some 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 back some socially redeeming features, which I think should be taken into account with respect to sentencing. But Mr. Graber was in a heavily traveled road a, approaching 100 miles an hour, uh, popping wheelies on a motorcycle and putting everyone out there at risk. And the trooper that pulled him over is not some cowboy undercover man. The trooper that pulled him over was off duty. He was trying to make a dinner date with his family. But because Mr. Graber's actions so alarmed him to believe that this guy was going to create a serious fatal accident, he took action and was trying to talk a uniform car in to stopping Mr. Graber. Mr. Graber suddenly went off an exit ramp 
before the uniform car got there, and the trooper saw this as his opportunity to stop Mr. Graber from continuing to create a serious risk to the people on the highway. So he pulled up. Now, Mr. Graber was aware that behind the trooper now, as the trooper, this trooper in his, in his personal vehicle pulls up and blocks Mr. Graber, that there is a uniform marked car with its lights on also coming up the ramp behind Mr. Graber. So when we point out the fact that this may have looked like a, a uh, carjacking, all right, um, why you would jump out of your car and carjack some guy on a motorcycle, I'm not sure you're going to trade the car for the motorcycle. That doesn't make sense. But this is where we get into taking things out of context, and this is exactly what Mr. Graber created by posting his, his uh, uh, video was that somehow this guy was some horrible, awful person who uh, with no concern when, when his real concern was to prevent Mr. Graber from, you know, orphaning children or putting them in wheelchairs for the rest of their lives by, by the, the manner of his driving. Um, to get away from the specifics of the case, which I think are, are uh, still being litigated, my concern is that we are trying to justify the Graber, the audio portion of the Graber piece, by saying that well, you can't have a private conversation in a public place. That's, that's one argument. And I, I disagree with that. I think that it becomes, because if you say that, if you say that you can't have a private conversation in a public place, you have basically eliminated all protection from the wiretap statute, meaning that another third party who was not a pro party to the conversation could then record the conversation of two other people in a public place, okay? Because the Maryland wiretap statute says that you are protected by, by having to require the, the, um, the um, consent of a party if it's a private conversation. And if you say that any conversation that takes place in a public place is not a private conversation, then no, no conversation is protected from surreptitious listening devices. And given the size of, you know, cell phones and whatever, you could wiretap, intercept the conversation of a couple sitting at a sidewalk cafe, you know, discussing their divorce terms or their child custody or something like this, okay? Um, you, could just, you could intercept the conversation of, you know, anyone who does not surround themselves by four walls, who wants to sit on a park bench and have a conversation, you would deprive them from, from protection from third parties um, intercepting their conversation. So I'm, I'm not in favor of that. I'm not in favor of completely surrendering any kind of converse, protections, okay? The other argument is that, well, police officers in uniform, which the officer in Graber wasn't, Okay, but police officers in uniform should have no ability to have private conversations with people when they are having their official duties. Well, that's all well and good if you're a party to that conversation and you want to record it. I'm in favor of that. As a matter of fact, I'm in favor not just of recording police officers doing their official duties. I'm in favor of recording senators, congressmen, county executives, all these other people you know, I mean, I would, many of the time have I been before some House member of the House of Delegates a, a, getting assurances from them that they would support my legislation, only to find out later they voted against it. I would be grateful to have a video or an audio of that assurance that they would vote in favor of my legislation to play right after they voted against it, but that's something else. But. Let's say that I'm a police officer and I respond to an accident scene and I'm trying to get information from a person who is trapped inside of a car about their medical condition, about their medical, you know, are they, are they diabetic, are they, you know, are they on medication, uh, what can I do for, for them until we can get them out of this accident, until we can get them cut out of the car. And I find out that the person who caused the accident 
after speaking to their lawyer on the phone, is standing there recording my conversation with this person who's trapped in the car. Now, I, you know, I, I brought up the fact that a police officer should be able to interview witnesses to shootings or who don't want to be involved in, who you know, constantly we have the problem of, you know, witnesses who don't want to get involved, who don't, didn't see anything, who didn't hear anything, and we have to encourage them, pull them off to the side to, in order to talk to them. If we suddenly find out that a police officer can no longer have private conversations with these people off to the side, that anyone may intercept this because these are not private conversations, we'll have an almost impossible job in getting witnesses to talk to us. And th this, this sort of blanket allow denying officers to have any sort of private conversation will interfere with law enforcement, will interfere with our ability to, to, to enforce the law. So I think that we need to be careful here between, you know, throwing the baby out with the bathwater and saying, well, we're, we're, you know, they can never have private conversations. They're in uniform, all right? Um, in, in the Graber case, you know, people will say, what's the harm? And my response is, well, the Maryland courts have made, the, or the Maryland legislature, at least in my reading of the statute, have made this against the law if the officer reasonably believes that he's having a private conversation with someone for them to intercept it without his permission, all right? And the response is, well, don't the police have cameras on their car that they audiotape people? And the answer is yes. As a matter of fact, the Maryland legislature specifically went back and amended the Maryland wiretap law to allow police officers to audiotape those types of encounters. They limit when that audiotape can be used. They specify that the officer must advise the person who's uh, uh, conversations he is recording that he is being audio and video recorded so that the person is aware of this, okay? So th there are, there is permission to do this, but there are also restrictions on how they can do it and what they're going to do. Um, I would be perfectly happy and hope that Maryland would become a one-party consent state, in which case Mr. Graber's audio taping of a police officer would in fact be legal because Mr. Graber would be a party to the conversation. But it wouldn't allow third parties to record a conversation between Mr. Graber and the police officer if neither one of them were aware of it or if neither one of them consented to it, okay? Um, I do believe that the police themselves have a misunderstanding of what the law allows, okay? Um, I do think that, that, that when we look at the videos, for example, the PG County video, I don't think anybody can claim that that recording was a private conversation. You can't stand in a crowd and scream at somebody and claim that you were thinking you were having a private conversation. I think the same thing with the videotape of the, of the Pimlico uh, audio tape. There's nothing there that would suggest that, that you could be in a crowd and say that you didn't you were having a private conversation. But again, part of this gets back to, I think, that the, that the law is confusing, that the police don't have a clear understanding of what, what taping is allowed and what is not allowed. I mean, I think that the Maryland statute uh, made things like, you know, Linda Tripp was prosecuted for what she did, and she was a party to the conversation. There was a question about the, the people that went into the ACORN office and did a recording in the ACORN office and about whether or not their um, audio taping of that was a violation of the Maryland wiretap statute. So I am, am against, I mean, I, I feel that statute is in for a major overhaul and that I seriously think that, you know, we need to do this. I've had instances where, and this is one of the problems, if someone makes an audio tape of a criminal act, that it can't be used by the prosecutor in evidence because the Maryland wiretap statute has a built-in exclusionary rule that says if someone audio tapes something that, that um, is a violation, it can't be used in court. 
So, in fact, I've had instances where an audio tape was made of someone being solicited to commit a crime and the criminal actually explaining to them how they can commit the crime, and it couldn't be used in evidence because the court ruled that the criminal hadn't, con the criminal thought he was doing this in private and that he didn't consent to his criminal activities being audio taped and therefore the prosecutor could not introduce that into evidence, okay? I've had an instance where a woman audio taped a, 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 her boyfriend sexually assaulting her minor daughter um, and that was the proof of that and we couldn't use that because of course that violated the Maryland wiretap statute. Uh, so I think that, you know, there's a lot of um, inconsistent and sort of, in, in some instances, ridiculous results coming out of the current law and it needs to be looked at. But frankly, folks, if it were not for my prosecution of Mr. Graber, we wouldn't be having this conversation about the Maryland wiretap statute. No one would be looking at it. You can't change a bad law by ignoring it or not making a point of it. You can only change a bad law by demonstrating to the people that look at it, hey, is this the result you want? Thank you. Okay, our next speaker has 33 years of law enforcement experience. He served in both the Maryland State Police and the Baltimore uh, City Police Department. And over the course of his career, he served in various capacities. He patrolled the streets, um, he investigated cases, and he also trained his fellow uh, police officers. For many years, he was a narcotics officer and he took pride in his work, but uh, he eventually came to the view that the drug war was a counterproductive way of addressing problems of uh, drug abuse and drug addiction. Now this isn't a forum about drug policy, but I mention that because he now serves as the executive director of an organization called LEAP, Law Enforcement Against Prohibition. And this organization is made up of uh, active and retired uh, police officers who speak out against the drug war policy and want to see the, the drug war brought to an end. They give speeches at universities, they testify before legislative committees, and uh, they appear on TV and radio talk shows, uh, and they're quite effective. Uh, we invited Major Franklin here today to give us the benefit of his experience and his training of other law enforcement uh, officers. So please welcome uh, Major Neil Franklin. Well, thanks for having me. It's uh, great to be back here at Cato. Um, just real quick, uh, for, for Joe, um, Joe and I uh, work together from time to time. And there's a reason why Joe is, uh, remains as the uh, chief prosecutor for Harford County, Maryland. It's because he's very good at what he does and uh, has a great relationship with uh, law enforcement and as, as well as the community. Um, I agree, for the most part, with everything what Joe said. We should be a one-party consent state, absolutely. Um, just real quick, just a little bit more about my background. In the mid-90s, uh, mid to late 90s, I was the um, criminal commander for, mo well, all the counties on the eastern shore of Maryland, and to include Harford and Cecil counties, and of course Harford County is where uh, Joe serves as well. And if this case, the case that we're, we're talking about, um, the Gaber case, if it would have come before me as the commander from my troopers, if I had been the one in charge the day that this took place, my advice to those troopers would have been, okay, let the traffic citation stand let him have his day in court as it relates to that and his driving maneuvers, which I agree were very, very unsafe. But as far as this wiretapping charge, um, I don't think so. I think it's a, a, a very bad move. 
And as the prior commander of both the Baltimore and Maryland State Police training divisions at one time or another, we would teach our officers that even though you have that power, even though you have the ability to charge people with various things under the umbrella of the law, it doesn't mean that you do so because you have to police not just for today but for tomorrow. And what I mean by that, it, it, it might be okay, it might be within the law to charge people with, with certain crimes under certain, certain circumstances, but is it the best decision for that community? Is it the best decision for your department? You know, what does it look like tomorrow and what does it lead to tomorrow? And that's what I see with, with this particular case. Um, we also have in Maryland um, a program at Johns Hopkins University which is for leadership training for law enforcement. And it's been around for a couple of decades and we send a large number of our current and future law enforcement leaders from many agencies within the state of Maryland and up and down the East Coast to this consortium. And as a matter of fact, they were very important when we initiated community policing, when we really took off with community policing. And there was an, an, a professor there by the name of Stephen Vicchio. And Stephen Vicchio would teach regarding law enforcement and morality and making good decisions and he used uh, you know the philosophies of Socrates and Plato and, and all of these wonderful uh, philosophers and, and really smart people and we teach to this sort of thing. I mean I can't recall any other case in my 33 year career that involved a situation like this to where we use this particular statute, this law, for, for such a, a reason. And I don't know what the dynamics were behind, I don't know what the conversations were among the law enforcement folks to, to come to this decision to, to make this charge and to do the search one on the home. But once again, it, it would have been something that I would have advised against, um, you know, in my position and from my experience and, and from the training that I've had. Um, regarding the law and, and, and public servants and that expectation of privacy, you know, first we are public servants. And I agree with Joe that there are times in the, in the performance of our duties where we may have that expectation of privacy with someone where a third party should not be able to record. But if you are one of the two parties, it should be permitted. Overall, for 90 something percent, I don't know what that exact figure is, but I know it's in the 90s, 90 something percent of the time that we're out there performing our duties, where we are state servants, you know, there should be very little, if any, expectation of privacy. We also teach that when you're performing your duties, do so as if you have a camera crew in your back seat. Channel 13, Channel 11, Fox 45, whoever they may be. That's how we teach. We, we teach our officers to understand and to know that in this day and age of technology, around any corner, on a corner of any building, in any walkway, on, at any public place, there's probably a camera. There's probably a camera, in addition to the indiv individual devices that we all carry. We all have cell phones for the most part, and just about any, I don't know if you can buy a cell phone today that doesn't record video and audio. So you have to police, you have to perform your duties in a manner knowing that this is a great possibility. As a law enforcement professional and as a law enforcement commander, I welcome the recording. 
except in those cases, like Joe said, when you're talking to someone about some information, it might be private to that person. And then you're, and, and there's a third party. But for the most part, I welcome it because if you are performing your duties appropriately, it protects you as a law enforcement official. And not just in law enforcement, but in other areas of public service. So with that, we can move on to question and answer. Okay, we're going to open up the floor now and take any questions that you may have. Uh, I just have three requests. First, wait for the microphone to arrive so that we can all hear your question. Second, identify yourself and any affiliation that you may have. And please keep your questions brief so that we can get to as many people as possible. Yes, ma'am. Okay. And I'm an independent TV program producer. And I have found all this police, uh, mis I call it misconduct. It's actually, there's no way that you should protect them. It's really beyond their responsibility or duties, but they sort of use that as excuse to do all kind of misconduct. So my question would be, besides say the citizens say, I'm not guilty, or we say the video, uh, the, the operator has a right to do that, can we go a step further, say, charge the officers with the crimes? Because they are basically it's robbery, a robber or conspiracies. And we do have a pr proof. We can really identify all these problem, uh, problems. The question is, which organization or project or state attorneys would really come out to do that? I think it's a great question on the scope of uh, citizen journalism. Uh, there's a case uh, from uh, our, the early 90s out in Seattle, um, <clears throat> and, uh, and, and it was a civil suit. And, and, you know, there is no, you probably won't see a prosecution for that, but there could be a civil suit uh, for a violation of uh, a civil rights uh, or for malicious prosecution. Uh, and in, in the instance in Seattle, there was a, an activist group that was having a rally, and they were marching. Uh, and, and one of the people somewhat affiliated with the group uh, had, uh, had appeared on public access television periodically and was recording the event. Uh, and so, uh, and, in, and this is a Washington state specific piece of the statute, but there was an exception to the wiretap, uh, the two party consent wiretap law in that state for members of the paid press. But the court looked into that and said, well, you know, what is the principle whereby you would separate the paid press from someone who is a citizen activist or someone who, you know, who, 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 uh, who documents these events? And, and there's no a special protection for the paid press versus a, a citizen who is bringing these, you know, these uh, events into the public sphere. Uh, that's a, it's a district court case, and it, it ended up not going anywhere afterwards, but, uh, um, but, there, but there's, you know, there's a serious discussion, there has been serious discussion in the courts as to, you know, who is a journalist? And as I mentioned in my prepared remarks, you know, who is a journalist now? Uh, now that legacy media outlets are, are really going away, uh, print media has, has largely gone away, uh, many newspapers now are, are strictly online. Uh, but there are people out there who, who blog uh, and will have an affiliated uh, Facebook page and a YouTube channel who are reaching as large an audience, at, you know, certainly larger probably than, than the local public access television is. Um, and so I think that that's really where you know, you're seeing this convergence of not just free speech but also freedom of the press because the individual is so empowered by technology now that it's much broader than it used to be. Did you understand? Yeah, just real quick. I, first of all, I think the media is actually recruiting uh, individual uh, uh, freelance uh, journalists, for instance, because what is the saying now? See it, shoot it, send it. Um, you know, so they're kind of encouraging. But as it relates to police misconduct, if you witness it, number one, I advise you to report it. Um, if you have the opportunity to make a record of it, I advise you to do that as well. But my advice to you is not to be so close as to interfere with the activities of the police officers when they are performing their duties. And to, to, I would also advise to do it in a manner to where it's quite obvious that you are recording it. But like I said, make sure you do not interfere either verbally or physically with the activities of the police officers because then you could be charged with hindering. Um, you know, I. Like I said before, I, I, I think it's 
I think it's, in my opinion, I think it's our, our duty to, as citizens, to report the activities of our public servants, uh, whether they're doing good or whether they're doing bad, not just doing the bad times, but also doing the good times. Um, and I, once again, I said I, I welcome that recording. And there was a question earlier as to just maybe how far, how widespread may this be? You know, how many times does this get reported? You know, because not everyone gets charged, but the video of the Preakness and the lady and, you know, for instance, that she wasn't arrested, so it didn't go any farther than that except for showing up on YouTube, for instance. But there are many, many, many cases, many times when police officers threaten people with arrest for making these recordings. I've had officers come to me to report officers that have made these statements to people and at times when they have actually made arrest and have charged the person with hindering, not so much under the wiretapping statute, but they will charge them with something else, such as hindering or failure to obey a lawful order, which really doesn't apply, but they make the charge anyway and then they end up in the detention center and state's attorney will eventually release them with no charges preferred or what have you. But it creates a huge problem in our society and it's up to law enforcement leadership to, to, to get a handle on that and do something about it in, in, in conjunction with our legislators. The, my, my only reaction is too that we need to be careful with one, people perceiving what the police are doing, because often you can come up on a situation and not have all the background um, of what's transpired up to that point. And I think the other concern as a prosecutor is people bringing me pieces of video or you know pieces of audio and wanting me to act on that without themselves presenting the full the full audio video to me um, I mean we we've had this problem in cases that I've had where I've had you know edited or uh, doctored tapes presented to me by people who want me to bring a prosecution based on that um, and as a prosecutor I'm a little leery to you know pursue some of this sort of stuff just because I'm not sure I'm getting the whole story even though I've got you know the picture in front of me um, so uh, I think that's going to be the other side of this as we have a society that generates more video and audio. We also have laptop computers that have the capability of editing this stuff. Um, and we're going to have issues there with with people arguing to me, well, you know, you've got the audio, you got the video right in front of you. Go, you know, go forward with a prosecution and my sense of, I know, but how do I know that it hasn't been doctored or, or, or edited? So, Actually, before we move on to the next question, I should note that one of the handouts for the forum is by Cato adjunct scholar Radley Balco, and it's entitled How to Record the Police. So if you want to engage in citizen journalism, he's got the uh, latest technology and some reviews. Yes, right here. Thank you, Raghavir Goel from India Globe and Asia today. My quick question is that uh, how do the law uh, differs between anything recorded by or videotaped by a journalist or by the news agencies and then the private citizens? And second, as gentleman mentioned about uh, boyfriend taping, uh, she taped a sexually assaulted daughter. Let's say if it was a video not audio, how it was going to be different. So the first point goes to who's a journalist again. Uh, right. So once again, I think this is a, you know, where do we draw the line at who, who is a journalist? And, and with the rise of new media, that's, that's a, a line that's really hard to draw. And I think the courts that may face these situations in the future, will, will, I think that line will go away, frankly, uh, over time. Uh, and then with regard to the, to the video, you know, once again, none of these laws say anything about video. So if there had been video associated with that case, then, you know, then Mr. Castle could have, could have taken that, uh, that case to court with no problem. Yeah. I mean, the, the, it, the problem was that the woman couldn't figure out how to video. I mean, sure, if she had the ability, she probably would have created a videotape. What she had done was she had a sus suspicion and she planted an audio recording device that she had acquired that was voice activated so that it could sit there until somebody started talking and then 
the recorder activated itself, and we weren't able to use that as evidence, I mean, um, be, because it was an audio tape. Um, and I just, you know, those are the kind of results that I think need to be looked at when we're, when we're crafting a wiretap statute and saying that we're, I mean, my biggest problem is we have a wiretap statute and arguably is to protect the citizens from the government. Well, if that's the case, why do we need two-party consent? I mean, let's restrict when and what the government can use wiretapping for, but what do we need two-party consent between, you know, citizens? How is that, where is the government involvement between two citizens having a conversation? No, I'm sorry. We have to move on. Yes, sir. For, for those two of you who don't work on the fourth floor at Cato here with me, uh, I'm Jim Harper of, of the Cato Institute, Director of Information Policy Studies, and I, I study privacy a lot. Uh, by way of observation, it's really interesting to me how the statutes try to rewrite a higher body of law, the law of physics. Uh, for the most part, you get privacy and you have a reasonable expectation of it by lowering your voice or moving to a place where others can't hear you. Law enforcement should be able to, if they need to interview someone uh, privately, move people away for the immediate circumstances. But I wanted to ask a, a, an interesting meta question a, a, of you um, about the decision to prosecute in this case. It seems like there are justice interests on both sides. Uh, the, this, this kid, I think, is just desserts or probably come from uh, being punished for the violation of traffic laws. And it seems a little bit, a little bit of uh, jumping up and down on him to, to pursue him also for the, uh, the wiretapping claim. On the other hand, you're fostering a, an important conversation about the law, and there will be justice coming out of it if the Maryland legislature changes the law. So um, I'd be interested in all of you, but, but especially you, Mr. Prosecutor, how do you make a decision in a case like this where I think you have discretion uh, to, to, to lean pretty hard on one person for the benefit of the broader discussion? Well, some... <laughs> One of the things that, that I think is important to understand is we have a system of government that prosecutors don't decide what the law is. Prosecutors are given the law and said, you know, told, and your oath is to enforce the law. Um, I don't agree with some of the handgun or gun restriction laws that we have in the state of Maryland either, uh, but I take an oath to enforce them. Um, but often when I enforce them, I may re recommend to the judge that the defendant be given a probation before judgment so they don't have a criminal record. I may recommend that they be fined nothing um, or, you know, you know told, told to write an apology letter or something like that. Uh, so the other side, the, the prosecutorial discretion can also go to this, you know, the outcome of the case, you know, no, no criminal record, no fines, no penalties, this sort of thing, um, and yet still make the point of you can't do this, at least under the Maryland law, you can't do this. Um, and that's my sense with pursuing this pr particular prosecution. I mean, the, the end result could be, and Mr. Graber has no significant record that I wouldn't be prepared to recommend that he be given a probation before judgment, that he not be fined, um, but still make the point of, this is what the law says. If you don't like the law, then we need to change the law, not ignore, you know, what I believe to be a violation. And if, it, and if I'm wrong, then there is a process in the court system to have an argument and have the court say, you're not, in, you're not interpreting the statute correctly, do something different. But I think simply taking the attitude of, well, we're just going to ignore all these cases because it's a muddy area, never results in a solution and, and never confronts the illogic, possibly, of the statute to make changes. What we end up with is, you know, continuing to allow citizens all over the state to be, to be under this law, felons, because they want to audio tape a conversation that they're a party to. Yeah, just real quick. And one of the, the problems that I have with this particular case is that um, it's not like the, the guy was secretly decided to record the conversation. The camera was already on while he was doing his shenanigans. The big, 
big camera on sitting on the top of his helmet, which is, you know, it's it's there, you know, to see. And so it's not like he, you know, decided I'm going to secretly do this. And here at Cato, we did a thing, uh, a program uh, a couple of months back on 10 rules for dealing with the police. And, you know, people ask, well, can I, should I record the conversation? Should I video it or whatever? I, and my advice to them is, yeah, do it, but let the police officer know that you're doing it. You know, don't, don't do it in secret. Just be up front and say, hey, I got this recorder here. I'm just recording our conversation. And so, you know, that's kind of like my, one of the issues I have with this case. It's not like he secretly did it. it. It was on his, you know, I mean, personally, if I'm the one that stops this kid and I see something on a, I mean, cops are supposed to be curious. We're supposed to ask questions. We're supposed to, hey, what's that on a helmet? You know, what is that? What is it doing? You know, what is I, you know, so that's one of the, the things that really, of many that don't sit quite well with me. Yeah, but, but let me just answer in the fact that he did not have the audio on until the officer approached him. He did not have the audio on as he's coming up the road at 100 miles an hour. Um, and then the officer goes out of his way to ask him, are you audio recording this? And he, in fact, says no. So the officer didn't think it was being audio recorded because instead of saying, yes, I'm audio recording it, he tells the officer, no, I'm not, and that's where it goes from there. You wanted to say something, Dave? I just, I think that uh, we should note that it's harder to find a more sympathetic uh, defendant here than, than a guy who serves in the Maryland National Guard, the Air National Guard, uh, as, a, in, as an airman. Uh, and uh, uh, within the military, I think a conviction of anything that carries a sentence over six months may require him to be administratively separated out of the service. Uh, depending on, I don't know the Air Force's regulations, I know the Army's, but, um, and, uh, you know, the speeding thing, I mean, he's, he's in the Air Force. I think they actually recruit people who feel a need for speed. <laughs> <laughs> okay, yes, ma'am. I'm sorry, I didn't hear the beginning of your comment. So I'm an attorney practicing oh. in town, um, and I... I'm curious, you know how when you call, you know, on any kind of your bills or whatever and they're recording what you're saying or something, they'll, they'll just do the announcement. It sort of goes to your your thing that if you tell them what you're doing, that could maybe be consent construed. I don't know. But could what if what if a policeman pulls up? What if they, they said, this is being recorded? Is that, you know, this, please be advised that anything you say will be recorded, like, like you get when you call these whatever things like that, right? Okay. Um, is, is that sufficient to, mis to you know, to satisfy the statute with respect to the consent? That, that's what the, the statute requires, simply that the officer advise you that you're being audio and visually recorded. Well, I'm not talking about the not officer. To get I'm talking about the person pulled over sitting in a car or something, somebody who's about to get a confrontation with a policeman. Right. Policeman walks up. They say, please be advised. This is anything you say will be recorded. I'm sure to shock them, but would that be sufficient to, the, to satisfy the statute? Policeman walks up. You say, Any, please be advised. Anything you say will be recorded. From the, you're saying the, from the officer? From the no, I'm saying that the person... Oh, you're having, saying that the person being sta stopped say that to the officer? Right. Does that satisfy um, the statute? I, I mean, I would assume that if you wanted to keep talking to them, then you, there's an argument that, like, like the old sign, if you enter here, you're consenting to be searched. So if you're advised that you're going to talk to me, I'm going to record it, and you talk to me, then... I suppose you could argue that that's a that's a uh, consent. Would, would they get cited for hindering or some nasty thing like obstructing or something? Or I'm not sure how you how you would justify that one. Me neither. Oh. Okay. Yes, over here. Hi, my name is Mike German. I'm with the American Civil Liberties Union, Washington Legislative Office, and. Um, we defend, of course, the, the two-party consent rule because it does tend to protect privacy better. And as a former law enforcement officer, I know that that does make the job a little bit more difficult, but, but it doesn't prevent them from getting recordings when there is probable cause to believe somebody's doing something wrong. There are avenues to recording that. So while we can have this debate about what the law should be, I am concerned about Jim's question that uh, the, the prosecutorial discretion in, you know, using an individual citizen as a pawn in that debate, 
using the law in a way that the legislator did not intend it. And, you know, any more than if, if you saw an altercation on the street and you ran up and you found out it was a mother who had just seized crack cocaine out of the pocket of her son, that you would charge her with possession of cocaine. Uh, you know, that there is prosecutorial discretion, and a prosecutor is not required to follow the, the, uh, the, the black letter of the law, but rather to act in the interests of justice. And if we're using this individual as a pawn in a, in a public policy debate, it, it, does that become prosecutorial discretion or uh, abuse? Well, I, first of all, I disagree that you're assuming that the legislature didn't uh, intend it to be used that way. And I say, I've read the law innumerable times. I don't see where there's any differentiation in the law for police officers in uniform on the side of the road as opposed to, you know, two people who pull over their car at the side of the road and decide to, you know, get out of their cars and talk to one another. Um, and, and one of them wants to record that and the other, without the other one's knowledge. Under the Maryland law, that seems to still be a violation of the two-party consent piece. Um, I mean, I, I'm not sure how you uh, argue that the two-party consent protects privacy when if, if I want to go to a used car lot and I'm going to go walk through there with some salesman who's going to pitch six cars to me, with, you know, and I want to record that so that later I can remember what he said about which car and what, you know, guarantees were, and I want to be able to play that back and remember, you know, this one was, you know, <coughs> only driven by the little old lady on Sunday and, you know, whatever. What's the harm in that? I mean, he intended for me to hear that, and I recorded it to preserve it, where does that violate anybody's right of privacy? Why, why do we need a two-party consent to, to protect, you know, the salesman from later being confronted with what he said to me? I mean, I, I'm still puzzled why we need a two-party consent <coughs> statute that somehow that protects privacy when I'm a party to this, quote, private conversation. Um, so, you know. Well, yes, ma'am. Just real quick. First of all, I, I wouldn't have, um, I wouldn't arrest a woman for possession of cocaine personally. But I know, but, but, well, here's the thing: police have latitude. Um, you know, they have that ability to decide whether or not they're going to make that arrest and, and charge someone with a particular crime. That's one of the great things about it: is that they're not compelled to do it. And in the case, in the example you gave of the woman, you know, taking cocaine from her son, yeah, that police officer would have that latitude to make a reasonable decision at that point. And in my opinion, a reasonable decision, if I had the facts, would not be, would be not to charge that mother with possession and to handle that case another way. Yes, seize the, the contraband and, and, and file a report. But personally, as a law enforcement officer on the street, if those were the facts that I knew, I would not do that. And so it's a, the same. This particular case with uh, that Joe handled, you know, there were a lot of decisions made before it got to his office. And it very well could have gone another way in a completely different direction, as I spoke to earlier. So the, lat the latitude is there well before it even gets to Joe. Okay. Yes, ma'am. Can you hear me? Oh, my name is Casey Wright. I work for uh, State Senator Jamie Raskin, uh, District 20 in Maryland, uh, which is Silver Spring and Tacoma Park. Um, my question is, uh, I guess, for Mr. Prosecutor Cassidy and, and Major Franklin. Um, when crafting a one-party consent statute, what kind of provisions, I mean, you, you, it doesn't sound like it makes sense to just have a blanket one-party consent, because, I mean, I'm thinking about well, first of all, you need to include the provision that if it's a public official t taping a private conversation, that that person with whom they're having the conversation should be advised. Um, but what other provisions do you put in there? I mean, I'm thinking of like workplace and school place bullying and, um, you know, private conversations being used to, to, to bully someone or, um, I mean, you had mentioned at some point um, a conversation when you are the target of 
um, you're the target audience. So if you're being threatened or, or something, but how do you legislate that? How do you draw the line? Because it sounds like if you just say in any situation it's one party consent, that there could certainly be situations where that would be violating the other person's privacy. But at the same time, it, you know, like you mentioned, if you're with the car salesman or if you're being threatened, it, certainly one party consent makes sense. So what would your suggestions be? Well, well first of all, I mean, I think that the, that the main purpose for a wiretap statute, because the main people with the ability to really do serious wiretapping are the government, should be restrictions on government action. Okay, so, and, and that's where it started. I mean, all these state wiretap statutes came out of what is Title III um, of, the, of the United States Code, where the United States enacted a wiretap statute and then said to the states, you can adopt our statute um, for your own, inter you know, for your, own, your government level wiretap. So uh, I think that the, the first thing we start with is, what is it that the government does um, that would interfere by way of wiretapping, electronic surveillance, whatever, that would interfere with our individual civil, civil liberties and craft a statute that first only impacts government action and what the government does? And then look at, okay, are there other situations that we need to protect, you know, people from, you know, illegal, you know, or intrusive acts by other people that, that would constitute an illegal thing. I mean, we, we currently prohibit videotaping of people in dressing rooms or in their own homes, okay, even though that act is done by third parties. Um, so we can examine situations where, you know, we, we may want to limit the ability of somebody else to audio tape too, but I think for the most part, you know, we've, you know, we've got a state of five million people and any one of them who during a private conversation with somebody else hits the record button on their cell phone is instantly a felon, you know, looking at a possible 10 years in jail. That just, there's no justification for a statute that does that, that creates felons of all these people in the course of, you know, recording, you know, the terms of a contract or something that they're discussing with somebody else. Right, and, and I agree with Joe, and maybe, you know, maybe there's a place for, uh, you know, um, in a statute that would say, okay, if, I, if you advise someone that you don't want to be recorded, then it would be a violation of that statute. So, for instance, if Joe and I are about to have a conversation, I say, hey, Joe, by the way, if you happen to be recording this, I, I don't want that recorded. I mean, so they're... That's a possibility as well. <laughs> I don't care, Joe. You can record. I, I, we should also note, I think, that, uh, that the that Maryland's built, or built themselves around this law in every instance where the police want to record something. So there's a separate, as we mentioned, there's a separate provision where when they pull someone over, they have to advise them, hey, I'm going to record this. Do you mind if I record this? And then they press their record button on their belt or their, on their you know, shirt. And, uh, uh, and then they say it again so that it's part of the, the recording and the consent is recorded. Well, they also have a bait car provision so that when someone ha steals a bait car, they can record that. They have a provision for interrogations. They have a provision for you know wiretaps where they are investigating a crime. If you're building around this law so much, maybe it's a sign that the, that the rule doesn't make sense to begin with and you should just go to one party. So copy and paste the federal code. Okay, I'm afraid we have run out of time, but everybody here is invited to the luncheon upstairs and we can continue the conversation up there. Please thank our panelists for a good discussion. <laughs>